and I thought I could do it all in 30 minutes. The more that I have matured and grown in the things of God, now it's like, how am I going to do it? Like, I, this, is, uh, this series is a part of the Understanding the Kingdom series, and I think this is 52, 53. I look back at when I first started, I thought that would have been impossible. Now it's I can't help myself because when you deal with one thing, it applies to the next and it builds and it builds and it builds. And there's so much in the Word of God that has to be laid out so that we understand the kingdom. That's that anointing of understanding. And guys, whether it's dealing with national issues, local issues, family issues, or even issues in your own life, you got to have this anointing of understanding because before you can provide a solution, you have to understand the problem. And a lot of the time, the problem isn't the devil. It's you. It's me. Because we're still acting according to the old man instead of not letting that part of us die so that we can walk in newness of life in Messiah. You see, if the old man is dead and now you're living the resurrected life, that means you do 180 degrees different than what you used to do. You do the Word. To truly understand the problem, you must also discern what cannot be seen and what cannot be said. I don't have the temperament of a counselor, but I have studied counseling enough to know that whatever the presenting problem is, is never the real problem. I've talked with therapists that said sometimes it took a year or two for the person to actually finally get to the place where they could deal with the real problem and present it. And until the question is asked, until it is identified, you can give them the answer all day and they will dismiss it. Now, I want us to point us back to Isaiah 11 and 3. Now, I want you to notice something here. The fear of the Lord is repeated twice. It not only said he would have an anointing for the fear of the Lord, but shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. So that means the fear of the Lord is significant. The Word says the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. The beginning of knowledge is the fear of the Lord. And hyper grace has destroyed the fear of God in the body of Christ. I don't fear, and what do they do? They fear the devil, but they don't fear God. I don't fear the devil. Now I respect power. Even Michael, the archangel, when he confronted Lucifer over the body of Moses, he said, the Lord rebuke you, because he understood and respected power. We don't respect ourselves anymore, and therefore we don't respect anybody else. That's why everybody's talking the way they are to each other. I mean, I, I've seen everything, but, you know, your mama was a snowblower or something. I mean, it, it is this horrendous, the bickering and the fighting even with the seminary for the first time in almost 40 years, I've had to apologize for the conduct of one of our students with what they were doing online. That is unacceptable. Because there's no fear of God. It says, it shall, this, this anointing will make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. In every situation, I've got to fear God, not people. I've got to fear God, not the world. I've got to respect God, not other things coming at me. And it says that he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, nor the reproving after the hearing of his ears. And I got kind of amused when I was reading this, and I was uh, reading some things that was being postulated by the rabbis. And they really didn't understand spiritual discernment. In the New Testament, we can. We see it when, uh, when Jesus met certain people. He knew everything about them. You know? And 
the rabbis don't understand that because it takes the Spirit of God on you to do that. Now, Elijah and Elisha could do that because they would, the, the, the enemy was complaining that the prophets of God knew what they were whispering in their bedchambers about their war plans. And so for them, they said, well, if it's not with the seeing of the eyes or the, or the uh, hearing of the ears, it has to be by smell. No. It's by when I respect God so much and, and I have fear of God and I have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of me, I can have discernment. And I can, I can sense what's really going on. And what I have found with dealing with people, they never really share the full truth. That's why the Torah requires you to hear both sides of the matter from multiple witnesses. Especially in America, what we do is we reframe the truth to prove our argument. And what we love to do is say, it's not my fault. Well, you were in the middle of it. And since it's escalated to the point that someone else has to deal with it, yeah, part of it is your fault. What you don't take ownership of, you cannot control, nor can you solve. And yet our, our culture is where we're seeing social engineering circles that are using both secular and esoteric techniques, using the Hegelian dialectic to lead society around like a bull with a ring in its nose. And we don't have the fear of the Lord to discern what they were really doing. We just react. Quit being Pavlo's dog and start trusting in the anointing of the Holy Ghost on the inside of you as you yield and bend the knee to Messiah to begin telling you. Once you, once you begin moving in this, you start yelling at the evening news. Because you can figure, you can sense the level of BS and just how tall your boots need to be sometimes on the evening news. Guys, we've got to move in these anointings. If we do not learn how to move in this, we will be leaders that can make decisions that others can already predetermine for us. It's called manipulation and witchcraft. I've talked to pastors that I've respected that have called people down in their church that came up and reworked all the problems because they wanted the church to do this and so, they, so there's 20 items that need to be dealt with on this particular situation and they present five because the other 10 point back to them and their need to repent. So they stifle all that. And all they do is, is this scream about these others. You need to do something. You need to do something. You need to do something. You know, a man of God, first thing he'll do is hit his knees and come back up and say, you need to do something, honey. I won't tolerate this. I will not be manipulated. One thing folks have learned, at least with biblical life, and this goes to the grace of God. I've had people get mad and say, you know what, I'm going to quit giving to your ministry, then go on. I will not be like the Levites in Malachi that I preach what people want to hear because that's where the money is. I will not be judged by God for doing it. I, if I have to, I will stand alone and be faithful with what Almighty God has taught me to preach. And if you don't like it, I don't care how many thumbs down you get, quit wasting your time and go listen to somebody that will itch your ear. You won't find it here. My call is to step on your toes and maybe whomp you upside the head every once in a while to get you to wake up so that you return back to the kingdom. That's my anointing. To go against it is to go against the very nature that Messiah has put on the inside of me. Guys, when we, we, we need to add the anointing of understanding and the anointing of wisdom. Wisdom gives us the ability to move prudently through situations and to avoid problems in the first place. Do you know what would stop 99.9% .9 of all church problems or Christians' problems when you quit responding in the flesh and start doing the Word?
We can have an anointing to administrate the solution with the greatest possible results. We can also add to administrative things in such a way that the problem never had a chance to develop in the first place. Now here's one for the church in America. The church is not a democracy. And a lot of churches had better be careful if your pastor is really following the Spirit of God and really on his knees before God. God will hold you accountable for what you vote on. I have gotten reports of some churches that got mad because God started moving and it wasn't the way that they wanted. And so they voted out the pastor and two years later that church isn't even there anymore. Better be careful. And pastors, you better be careful. How many know this thing is a double-edged sword? We have got to walk in the fear of the Lord. How many know we see in the Old Testament when you had leaders gone awry, quick God was quick to judge? I remember one preacher that lived a very, very long life, and he said, he said, here's the, here's the deal I got with God. If I ever get off and refuse to repent, take me out before I lead others off. That was his covenant when he, God called him to ministry. If I get off and I won't repent, take me out before I lead people off a cliff. How many know that he walked on eggshells before God his whole life? Guys, it can be a frustrating or even devastating thing to be able to comprehend what is really going on and be powerless to formulate or engage the solution. That's why we need to have wisdom and understanding. Christians should be known for being problem solvers, not problem makers. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, not the pot stirrers. We have forgotten, even as we're talking about our Hebraic heritage and a lot of the things that is going on in the Hebraic community and all the fighting and backbiting, You've never been taught yeshiva. And in a yeshiva, let's say that I and Troy, we're we're on opposite sides of the debate. Okay, and he gives his debate, I give my debate. And then the the rabbi would stop and say, now you give Michael's side. And Michael gives your side. You see, Hebraically, you can never properly address an issue until you hear what the opposite side is saying and understand it. So Hebraically, you cannot give a response until you have developed the ability to hear, not for your ability to win an argument and drag people over the coals. That's as much a part of our Hebraic heritage as it is walking in the commandments of God. But it requires wisdom and understanding. God will never reveal a problem that he does not provide a solution for. We can, this, this is a hermeneutical principle. Man fell in Genesis chapter 3. Adam, you're going to die. You know, that would have been the end of the Bible. Right there. But as soon as God announced the problem, he promised the solution. I got this, I'll fix it. It may take me a while. Here's what you do in the stopgap until I can take flesh, stand in your place, do what you couldn't do. And that pattern, see, that's, that's, that's a principle of first mention. So the very first problem that man ever faced, God immediately provided a solution. And it will be that way every single time in our life. Once I properly identify the real problem, I will find the real solution in the Word of God. And once I implement it, the kingdom of God will be enforced in my life. But until you identify the real problem, to learn the real solution, you're shadow boxing. And don't confuse labor with results. Here's the next one you need to take to the bank. God never reveals a truth that he does not provide the power to walk in it. 
You may need to die in the process. <laughs> die to self. Crucify that part of your life and bring it into submission to God. But he will never reveal a truth that he does not provide the power for you to walk in it. Otherwise, it's a tease. That's also why all the promises of God are conditional. Even salvation is conditional. If you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and his completed work and bow the knee, you aren't saved. I don't care how many days a week you go to church. Everything is conditional. He shows the solution. He gives you the power to walk in it. Both of these anointings are developed through waiting on the Lord and through meditating in the Word. I have waited a long time for a lot of things. Now, I'm, I'm going to share something with you. When, right after Mary and I first got married, we went up to Gary Hedrick's church up in Rolla. Loved that pastor. I never saw anybody love the Word of God more than he did. He would get so excited about what he was teaching, he'd just stop and just shake and go, this is so good. I mean, you, you just, you, he's a, he was a big teddy bear with an anointing to preach the Word. Loved the man. And Mary and I went up, and, and there was this woman that was very, very prophetic. I mean, accurately, and had never been in that church before. And had accurately told people what was going on. And I'm just sitting there thinking, hey, this is really cool. I'm just going to sit here and enjoy it. And she called me out and spoke some things over me. She called Mary out and said, you're called to intercessory prayer. Now, back then, Mary said, oh, Great. Now she lives to pray and get in the presence of God. Now that was a long, long time ago. We're talking 81, 82, 83, right in there somewhere. I'm just now starting to walk in what she prophesied over me. So God gave a promise. But we forget not only in the Word of God, but when God gives prophetic words, He's saying, this is what's possible through me if you will yield to the process of getting there. Why was it I'm doing what I am doing now 20 years ago? Because of my own boneheaded stupidity. I will be the first to tell you because of my own carnality, because I would not wait upon the Lord and let Him transform me. I thought, well, I'm just going to claim it by faith. I'm going to claim it by faith. And I had lost the Hebraic concept that once what faith causes you to do is to throw off everything in your life that's in the way of what God told you. When Abram walked out of Babylon, he was supposed to leave everything. In fact, he was supposed to leave father and mother to do it. And he took daddy with him. And he only went so far and he awaited there until daddy died before he'd go on further. And once you see that, you see this transformation over the years from a guy that was Abraham to a guy that was Abraham. He was worried about what Pharaoh was going to do and he feared him. And then later on in his life, he had the armies of four kings. That took Sodom and Gomorrah and he says, we're just going to round up some of the boys. We're going to go down there and get them back. Different man. Different man. Because he understood the covenant and that covenant changed him. That's why God changed his name. That's how we get there. God says, I show you this promise. I show you who I want you to be in Christ. Now bow the knee. Develop wisdom and develop understanding because you seek me and you wait on me and you get in my word. The word of God is supposed to correct us, not entertain us. The word of God is more than a promise box. The promises of God in Jesus are yes and amen, the word of God says. But that's in a life that's totally consecrated to Christ and has, it has bowed the knee. Where the character of Christ is established, the promises of God just flow just like this. People say, well, then, Mike, why isn't it flowing that way in my life? You already have your answer. 
the character of Christ is not established in those places, which means there's going to be repentance that we need to do. There may be, there may be, there, there, there are times, especially when it's recent, that there's reparations. Do you know that? The Bible says if you stole, as an adult, you stole, and you get saved, you got to go make reparations as part of the repentance process. You have ought against your brother, you leave your gift at the altar, you go back and make it right with him before you can go back and offer your gift before God. All these concepts are in the Word, but we turn a deaf ear, and then we wonder why the Word's not working. When you have repented, and you've done everything that you know to do, you're in the best position for a miracle. You're in the best position for God to move supernaturally in your life. But when you sit here in the flesh and you fold your hands and you're saying, you know what, I'm not going to do a thing. I'm just going to trust God. I don't have to change. The devil's the one that's going to have to change. When you're living and you're flowing in the devil's stuff, if God judged the devil, you would go with it. Our task is like when Jesus, and Jesus was able to look at the devil and say, you have nothing in me. Man, what a statement. What a statement. The job of the believer is to be quick to repent, wait on God, let him show things, and we repent, we learn, we change, so that we can get to the place where we're in spiritual warfare and we're toe-to-toe with the devil. And he's looking at us, and let me tell you something, he can perceive more about you than you can perceive about yourself. And he looks at you, and he sees nowhere that he can hit. He sees nowhere that he can grasp onto and identify. Is the moment that you'll see fear in the devil's eyes. Because everywhere he touches, he gets a hold of God. Everywhere he touches, he gets a hold of Jesus' character established. Everywhere he touches, there's the fire of God. Everywhere he touches, there's the anointing of the Holy Spirit. How many know anytime he touches those things, the devil has a bad day. That's when the shield of faith can quench every fiery dart of the enemy is when it's all Jesus and it's all anointing and that I have put on his character and my armor is intact and all he can see in me is Christ in me, the hope of glory. That's when the warfare gets real and that's when the warfare, it quickly ends. Prolonged warfare is usually caused by an unrepented life. We need to also remember that great leaders in the body of Christ have also been deeply reflective thinkers. Now don't go to the Scripture and nip it off and say, Thank not. That is not a commandment. It is not a commandment. The devil, you know, the word word does those are certain things we're not supposed to think on or dwell on all the time. Paul said, think on these things, those things that are good, things that are pure, those things that, that bring praise. But those of us that reflectively think and pray before God and let them, I've had times in my life, guys, that I've really looked for God to, like, I need some answers. And as I I examine myself with fear before the Lord, the Lord will show me attitudes in me that needed to change, concepts in me that needed to change, half-truth doctrines in my life that needed to change. And as I did, it closed the door to the devil. And that, that very same area that was a problem in my life, and when you close the door to the devil, his influence wanes to almost nothing. But it, there's, the, the kingdom of God is binary. When you close the door to the devil, you open the door to God. But without repentance and returning to the word, when you close the door to God, by default, you open the door to the devil. So our challenge, whether it's internal attitudes, lies and philosophies, the greatest warfare you'll ever, you'll ever face is right between your two ears. 
Paul deals with it in 2 Corinthians, but he tells us the power of God is greater and you're given supernatural power to pull down your thoughts, pull down your attitudes. And there's a lot of things over the years that I had to not only crucify, but I had to take two or three, four or five nails and I had to beat that thing to where there was no way it was getting off the cross. Because it was ingrained. Anybody ever deal with something that's ingrained in you? But you ever ask who ingrained it? It may not have been God. Well, Father, we come before you today in the name of Jesus. Father, our desire is to cultivate the anointings of Messiah in our life. Father, I ask that we become people that learn to be quiet before you and be reflective in our prayer life. That we can listen to the Holy Spirit, that we, that we run toward correction, not avoid it. That we can let the Holy Spirit show us where the devil got in. That he can adjust us. Because until we're adjusted, the devil can never have his adjustment. Father, we ask for an anointing. We ask that the blood of Jesus would cover every sin in our lives. We ask that the Holy Spirit would move to reprove us, to correct us through the Word of God. And that He would build us up in our most holy face so that we could stand strong in every area. And Father, that for the first time in our lives that we could be the one causing problems for the devil. Our greatest desire is to be like Jesus who went about doing good and destroying the works of the devil. Now, Father, we give you the praise and the glory for it. We know that this one prayer is not going to do it, but, Father, we ask that you would enter us into the process of sanctification. And, Father, help us. We plead, walk in these anointings so that we would be a bride without spot and wrinkle and that we would be a force for good in the earth, that we would learn to be the end-time warrior remnant that's going to accomplish great exploits. And Father, we thank you and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name.